debt. Um, I'd like to talk about workflows and gateways. Workflows tie heavily into reproducibility. We'll briefly, very briefly, survey a couple of our resources. They're available at no charge for everyone in this room to do research and beyond. And then some other initiatives, something called Open Compass. We'll be handing back and forth, getting really into community data, and closing with a few examples of things we're doing at PSC and with a very broad community, both in Pittsburgh and nationally. Okay, so first, um, PSC is here because we are a joint institute of Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh. We've been around 32 years, and we do a number of things. We have large systems, as in the top left, where we support open science. We also lead research projects. Right now we have about 30 active grants, of which only five of those are supporting the big systems. And so these collaborations are ways that we work with the community on leading and enabling science. We lead national training. We have a workshop calendar on our website and we distribute that through MCS that is rotates through topics, one of which is big data and artificial intelligence. And that one is very well attended, everyone here is welcome. We are actively supporting both the PIP and CMU communities, as in the top right. Um, we provide networking to the region. Uh, that, of course, is essential for moving data around. We've supported some people in this room on how to get data from their labs to really high-end data and compute resources. And then we also work with industry. <coughs> so I'd like to jump very quickly to this is just one slide, it's a cartoon that represents workflows. And to me, scientific workflows and data workflows are a way of capturing what you've done, maintaining that provenance, enabling reproducibility, because now you have a record and you can re-execute that workflow where you have a complete record of all the data provenance, the tools, perhaps even the software and the binaries, such that you can reproduce what you need at will. Um, this example is from the Center for Causal Discovery. And this was an NIH Big Data Knowledge Center of Excellence that was a collaboration, well, it's a collaboration between University of Pittsburgh, um, Carnegie Mellon, Department of Philosophy, PSC, and Yale, with various other collaborators for different things. And so in this, the gist of this one is that we deployed an open web client that ran on any, runs on everything from tablets to laptops. That talks to our big system that most people do cause and effect relationships in big data, looking at lung disease, genomics, and brain dysfunction, without ever knowing they're actually using what we call a supercomputer. That's all behind the scenes. It's software as a service, it's very cloud-like, and it is democratizing. It lets everybody use these features without having to become programmers, and really supports reproducibility. Our big machine right now is called Bridges. We really designed this to support open science and all the things we've been talking about. Um, it has, you can read what's here, these slides will be available. It has a lot, it has about 29,000 cores. We've just added, well we're in the process right now of adding a number of GPUs that Paula would talk about. And this really does support the integration of high-end computing, data, and artificial intelligence. It was the first machine in the world to do that, and has now been copied in several other places. This is free. Um, for research, you can have it for for research, for coursework, anywhere from small allocations you get a day through millions of hours, all at no charge. We support on here, we designed to operate very, in a very easy to use way. So it supports what you already do. It supports Jupyter, Python, Anaconda, MATLAB, R, everything people already do. You do not have to learn different things to run on this, even though it's a, you run a thousand times bigger. And so that is uniquely enabling. Like transition over for some new, piece, new pieces of bridges. Uh, thank you, Nick. So what I'm going to talk about now is uh, one of the latest uh, expansions that we are going to have on bridges. So we are uh, planning, as of this week and next week, to incorporate a new uh, element in our big system, which is called uh, we, which we call bridges PL, and it comprises uh, one media media DGX two box. Uh, for those of you who know, this is the latest and greatest uh, system for doing deep learning at scale. So when you talk about uh, what GPUs to use when you're uh, training your models or doing inferencing, 
if you're talking about a single GPU, it might look like uh, the cost benefit, uh, the best option considering cost benefit uh, is not a Volta. Like, I mean, we can talk about that later, but then when you're talking about scale and doing data parallelization and model parallelization and using many GPUs at the same time, uh, there is no better system at the moment that uh, DGX2 is highly interconnected to make all the D, uh, all the GPUs work at once. Uh, it brings uh, a total of 2.4 terabytes, I'm sorry, 2. Point, uh, petaflops of mixed precision. Uh, so we are very excited about uh, putting this out there. As Nick mentioned already, uh, all of the resources that we have and all of the services that we have at the center are for free to open science. So open science and enabling open science is basically at the core of our mission at the center. Uh, and this is going to be as well. We are starting a early user period this year that goes until December. And we are welcoming new users that uh, think they can uh, or yeah, can leverage these resources and do deep learning at scale. We are uh, welcoming them and uh, offering guidance through the process. So it's a total of uh, 88 volts. Uh, so one DGX2, but also nine servers, each of them with eight volts, so it's a total of 88 volts. It's a very, very powerful resource that we are very excited to make available. Um, another um, initiative that we have at the center to help open science and to help advance in particular AI at scale is this uh, initiative that is called Compass. Uh, what Compass is about is about letting users in the open science community access, uh, getting early access to the latest, the latest and greatest technologies that are designed for artificial intelligence. Uh, not only get access and get, be able to get their hands dirty with it, but also get support and get guidance in terms of what technology, what uh, accelerators, storage, interconnects are the best options depending on the model. So depending on the type of work you're trying to do, uh, it can be that you, uh, bottleneck is on compute or maybe on transfer or maybe on the memory of the accelerator. Uh, that's the kind of things that we are exploring. So what we have is this six front initiative that has a compass lab, which is the actual uh, processors and interconnects and uh, technologies uh, or well, FPGAs. We have open compass, which is working with uh, a selected group of uh, representative uh, science projects where we are benchmarking these technologies and bringing or coming up with uh, best practices that then we can disseminate. We have the Compass Consortium through which we collaborate with uh, the private sector to get representative use cases uh, out there that are needed in production. And then we have the education and training component where we disseminate these best practices. Uh, we also support community data sets that are necessary for uh, deep learning and uh, well, making uh, happen this, uh, well, being able to execute these projects. And we also have Compass Research, which is research in the uh, scaling part of artificial intelligence. Uh, Open Compass is the part where we work together with uh, projects. If you have a project that you would like to have benchmark in different uh, deep learning technologies, different GPUs, in different to have it. I mean, to have your code scale beyond more than one GPU, maybe use more than one processing node. Like it, it doesn't have to be a GPU. There are many machine learning applications that benefit uh, greatly from regular uh, processing cores. Uh, you're more than welcome to talk to us and, and see a way in which we can work together. Uh, in the community data sets part, um, what we do is for certain mature corpus of data, we offer uh, the opportunity to host it in our, uh, in our systems. Um, we are uh, mainly interested in community data sets that are relevant for a specific uh, field. So say ImageNet or MNIST, Oh, another example is the GDL project, which is uh, constantly scrapping the whole news of the world and identi identifying people, events, locations, and making graphs, or the common crawl. These are data sets that are big, that are relevant for our community, uh, that want to be shared. Uh, so we are, uh, we would like to, or we have this opportunity to host data sets like these ones and offer 
take care of like the hosting of the data, moving the data and all that and allowing just uh, users to focus on their science. Uh, we also, if you have a data set that you actually want to make available to your community, we can also consider having that one. And um, you can limit the access to whoever you want, if you want it to be completely public or if you want it to be available to just specific groups. Uh, that's uh, something we can do. Um, I just want to mention, so the Common Crawl, for instance, is a very big data set that is in the petabytes, so two petabytes and growing of data. It's currently hosted, for, uh, for example, in Amazon. Now, what happens when you want to really query that amount of data? It's very pricey. So one of the benefits of this initiative is that you have the data here hosted at PSC, but then it's, it interoperates with uh, high performance computing capabilities. So we have a huge machine that can, for free, query the data. We have all the tools, Hadoop, Spark, uh, other uh, frameworks for uh, deep learning. Oops. And uh, so that's, that's game changing. So that really makes you be able to use the data. With that, uh, I'm gonna pass it to Nick, who's gonna talk about some examples of other data sets. Okay. So I'm very quickly gonna wrap this up with two quick examples. Um, the first is the Brain Image Library. This is an open science project we host at PSC. Alex Rupaleski, who is our biomedical director, is the PI of this, along with our Mar Marcel Roche over at Biology, and Simon Watkins at Pitt, Center for Biology Imaging. Um, the objective here is to really amass the world's best and only compendium of confocal fluorescence brain microscopy data. Because they're looking at mice, marmosets, and rats, and they're shooting for 10 petabytes is what they expect in this pilot phase. And this is a great resource for people here at CMU and Pitt and beyond. It really is a national global resource for doing neuroscience research. The other thing we have just begun is the Human Biomolecular Atlas Program. This is a large NIH initiative. And in this initiative, they're looking at really obtaining very high resolution imaging, omics, and single cell sequencing for all major tissues in the human body, except for brain. And that's fine, because we do brain in a separate place. Um, we, have, we applied for and won the infrastructure component for this. Um, we are doing a hybrid solution where we're having HPC here in Pittsburgh, blending with cloud resources, such as in Amazon, and giving you research the best of both worlds. This we gain tissue data in from tissue mapping centers at and five different sites, Florida, Caltech, Stanford, Harvard, and Vanderbilt. And then supporting other researchers across the country um, to do development of tools. One of those projects is here at Carnegie Mellon by Ziflar Joseph in computer science and computational biology. But other tools developers at Harvard, people do mapping, where mapping in this case means what's the coordinate system? How do we do queries across the body of all these things coming in in these different modalities? where we're looking at combinations of standard imaging, mass spectrometry, single cell sequencing, RNA-seq, proteomics, transcriptomics, all these different kinds of tissue data, and how do we map that onto coordinate system for different humans that are different shapes and let them do visualization and analysis in a meaningful way. Um, this is beginning. We had a kickoff meeting last week at NIH. We expect this data to grow between, our best guess is between 10 and 100 petabytes. Uh, we will see as we go through the next few months how we will actually get um, just a four-year project to build it, then at least three years production after that. And it's a really exciting opportunity for CMU, Pitt, and the Pittsburgh region. So I think we're out of time, so take a couple questions, I guess. <laughs> Last thing I want to say, summary slides will be green, but we're having a workshop tomorrow, two to four, which is hands-on on using bridges for anyone who wants to just figure out how it works, see what, see if it works for them, and also walk through how to get an allocation at no charge. And that is really important. Um, just get going. And final calls, if anyone does have data, think of all those community data sets. We're looking at an initiative for building scientific research data management in Pittsburgh in a very large way. If anyone has data they would like to have posted and supported, please talk to us. Great, does anybody have any questions for Nick and Paula? So 
Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question. You were talking about um, these hybrid solutions where people can move between um, between this these local uh, hardware that are stored in the basement somewhere around here and in the cloud wherever and that's stored in some basement somewhere else. Um, and I wonder if, if you could say a little bit about the technology that allows people to move easily between those. Usually moving between those kinds of things is, is actually really hard. Huge barrier. Okay, let me begin. I think you have more. So I think, first of all, I'm jealous. You apparently have a very big basement. <laughs> <laughs> um, but seriously, if we so for the hive, what we're, there is a combination of workflow. It's all the connections you want in the hive. We're using a combination of Globus and Irons, which have nice connectors between what we do and the cloud. To be clear, what we do has advantages in that the compute is free. It's already funded by our national tax dollars. So that's completely free. The storage is also free for research. And we can do things at very big scale. We can use the GP resources that Paula mentioned for doing AI in these data sets. We, can have, we have large memory nodes with up to 12 terabytes of RAM each. So we do an awful lot here that doesn't have a business case for the cloud. The cloud, on the other hand, has a lot of community data sets that are already out there. It has massive scale. And so there, there are reasons to use both. Um, for this project, we really see it going back and forth with our and Globus, where data is computed in the cloud, comes back here to be stored. And but there are other things for other workflows. And do you want to address any of those? Um, well, what I would add to what Nick said is that uh, at the center we have a network. Uh, group that is uh, dedicated to define the better ways or best ways to move a particular data set. So when we have a very big data set depending on where it is and where technologies that are supported, we have to work around. Uh, usually if it's big uh, and, and we can do globals, that's uh, the by default option or we use grid FTP. I just have to say that in general when you deal with a lot of data and a lot of data movement, you uh, want um, and you have the cloud in the picture <coughs> given the fact that the cloud uh, charges for aggressive data, you have to think your workflow in such a way that you minimize that burden, right? That can go very high, very quickly, uh, depending on how uh, data intensive is your workflow. Uh, but usually what we do is we work on a case-by-case -case basis. We can speak on a specific projects where are the solutions that we have used. Um, but then in that same line, uh, that's why maybe having the data very close to the compu compute, if that's an option, it's very uh, beneficial because, well, there is the time delay, but also the, the cost of moving the data associated. So, yeah, and, and the other obvious thing is containers. So we support containers on bridges, and if you containerize your application, it can just move back and forth. Actually, I, I have a question here <laughs> about like the community data sets. Like, uh, do you actually um, provide support for like data analysis? So on bridges, like we have a very mature, and we take care of supporting or keeping the environment like Spark and Hadoop and all that updated and working. So there are a number of tools that are out there. Uh, if there is a specific project that is uh, interesting for the center, like we can have some people, some I don't know, employees or interns, it can be dedicated to work together with a, a, a specific project to do the actual beta analysis and execution, I don't know, execute the algorithms and whatnot. But um, it's not that by default element of, it's not a, a, an included element of this initiative, but can be done provided that there's interest in both parts. Okay. Yeah, one, one last thing I think you'd like to mention is when you get an allocation of this system, like I said, that's free. You can also request what's called extended collaborative support. And what that gets you is up to 20%, nominally, could be more, of a person who can then work with you to develop approaches, to maybe look into some data analysis, to do scaling. And that nominally is 27 person for a year. Also at no charge, so it's a good, good way to get started. So all in all, like the initiative, there are many things we are doing. Our <coughs> But a core part of our mission, like the reason why the center exists, is to enable data science by providing infrastructure, storage, and also support. 
So if you have uh, a project in which you think we might be helpful, just uh, come and talk to us. We might find, we, we will help you find out like which of these initiatives or these services would fit your needs. Okay, our next speaker is Dan Valen, who works on strategic partnerships at Figshare. Thanks everyone. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Excited to be here. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick overview of uh, Figshare for all of y'all. Um, if you have not heard of it, um, this is our slogan. Figshare is a platform that allows you to store, uh, share, and discover research. Um, we loosely define digital research uh, to encompass all the outputs as that are a result of research. So this could be raw data outputs all the way up to uh, 3D printable images. Um, you'll notice on the left here, where it says discover research from uh, Figshare, there are featured categories. Uh, they are cross-disciplinary. So we're known as what's called a generalist repository. Um, so we accept content from across all disciplines. Um, and some of the features of uh, Figshare, once we publish content, uh, we assign open licenses for reuse of that content. Uh, we assign digital object identifiers, persistent identifier that aids in the ability to uh, cite that research. Uh, we allow for the versioning of that content, and we ensure that that content is available. Um, so we have a robust infrastructure uh, to facilitate that, which I'll get into in just a bit. Um, so to kind of stick with the theme of our uh, slogan here, on the store side, it's a way to host your data publicly or collaborate privately. So uh, in the back image there, um, you'll see uh, kind of the dashboard that you see once you log into the platform. It allows you to create projects and collaborate privately um, prior to publishing your research. Um, you can also annotate, add, uh, assign metadata to that research um, to give it as many descriptors as possible so people uh, can understand what research it is that you're publishing. And once you do make it openly available, um, you can see this is actually a, uh, I looked this up earlier, Chrysopa talidid, Chrysopalidid. Um, it's a sea worm. Those are its jaws in a 3D printable STL file. Um, if you were to actually visit this on the site, it would be spinning and you could 3D print it um, if you had the capability to do so. Um, so once you do make your research public, uh, we do aim uh, to make it as discoverable as possible. Um, speaking of the STL previews, uh, we also aim to create previews of your data. Um, so once you publish content to Figshare, we actually have support for over 1,200 file type extensions uh, to really highlight your content, and that's the first thing that you see once you land on an article page. Um, and so uh, there's actually a screen grab of a uh, Jupyter Notebook, so we have preview functionality for Jupyter Notebooks, uh, STL files, I mentioned the 3D printable files. Um, I think the most recent one was FITS, uh, which is a deep space astrophysics imaging uh, file type. So uh, we really try to bring your research to life. Um, and I also wanted to highlight this little piece here. Uh, we do support the versioning of your content. So once it is publicly available, uh, you can actually version and iterate it and the DOI will uh, reflect those versions as well. Um, and the final piece of our slogan, discoverability. So we took a look at how uh, researchers or the public is coming to the site, and we found that over 60% of the traffic comes from Google. And so I know there are some librarians in the room, your, your mouse. Um, but we realized the importance of Google in uh, driving traffic and, um, uh, and, and, and really landing on the site. And so we do make sure that all of our content is indexed and marked up appropriately uh, for discoverability on Google. Um, and where appropriate Google Scholar. So we do have relationships with the teams there. I think the most recent and exciting development is uh, Google Dataset Search. Has anyone heard of this? Yeah, so uh, this was a recent announcement from Google. We were actually an alpha tester. Um, so all of the fiction content, if it is considered a data set, it is um, indexed by Google Dataset Search, and so that's what the screen grab is down here. Um, but also just to steer away from Google for a second, um, we are indexed across uh, a lot of the community initiatives. So I mentioned uh, here data site share and the data citation index. We also work with BioCaddy and uh, Data One for Earth Sciences research. And so we try to make the research uh, as discoverable in the relevant places so researchers can actually uh, find that content. Um, just a little background of kind of where we've, we've, we've gone and, and the communities that we're working with. 
Um, Figshare is about a six and a half year old company. Uh, we started initially out of our founder's PhD as a way to share these non-traditional research objects for credit. So it was initially built for end users. Um, if you go on the Wayback Machine and look at early iterations of Figshare, it's a hilarious words that WordPress blog. I recommend you do that. Um, but we still, at the core of our mission, want to make a free service that allows individual researchers to publish their content. And so if you go to Figshare.com, you can create an account and you can upload as much content as you would like. There are some limitations on the file sizes, but other than that, we really do try to um, incentivize researchers to make their content publicly available. Um, in building out that infrastructure, we've actually started to serve multiple communities. Um, the first of which were uh, academic publishers, actually. So back in 2013, uh, PLOS, the Public Library of Science, came out with an open data policy saying, uh, if you publish with PLOS, you have to have a data availability statement saying where the underlying research lives. Um, and Figshare kind of, they, they came to us and said, can you extend that infrastructure to actually support this initiative for us? So we host all the supplementary material for PLOS, we do a lot of the visualizations of their content, um, and we've since started working, I think we're, uh, working with over 25 academic publishers at the moment, um, and providing a suite of services. Uh, the most exciting development, and it looks like Vaughn is still here, um, is we, are, we were approached by the American Chemical Society to act as uh, the infrastructure for uh, Chem Archive, or their chemistry preprint server. Um, we're also working with uh, Sage Advance, and trying to really uh, you know, stick with that initial theme of ensuring that your research is as uh, openly available as possible. Um, we also work with institutions. I would be remiss not to mention uh, KillTub, which is uh, Carnegie Mellon's repository, um, which is powered by Figshare. Uh, I do have a screen grab of Janelia up there. I'm sorry, it should be KillTub. It should be some nice target. <laughs> um, but, uh, so we work with universities globally, uh, as well as institutional labs. Um, we also support conferences and proceedings, and we've recently started working uh, more closely with foundations and actual governments and government agencies uh, in supporting their initiatives. So some of the ways that uh, users interact with Figshare, um, on the top part you see a public profile, on the bottom is kind of our uh, dashboard that you see once you log in. Um, it's a way to allow individual researchers to publish their content for credit. Um, I'll get in, in, into how we capture that. Um, it's hosted data uh, anywhere in any file format um, and accessible from anywhere. So we're built on Amazon Web Services, on the cloud, if you upload your content there, you can, as long as you have access to the internet, you can download and view it. Um, public and private storage spaci spaces, which I touched on, the collaboration tools, and all published items receive that uh, data site DOI. Um, we do have a bunch of case studies uh, looking at multiple disciplines. We also have a really exciting uh, new podcast called The School of Batman, where uh, <laughs> the premise is Batman is trying to solve a problem and he can only uh, solve that problem with the help of a specific sci scientist. So individual researchers can talk about their research and how they can uh, help Batman save his problem. So it's everything from researchers who are building lasers to uh, linguists who are trying to uh, solve language problems. And it's really cool. Um, but you can learn about our case studies, uh, if you can fix your case studies, or School of Batman. I recommend everybody give it a listen. It's pretty uh, professional. We were at the uh, Fringe Festival this summer, which is kind of cool. Um, I also talked about getting credit for your research. Uh, one of the ways that we do this, we, we really play close with the community. We were an ORCID launch partner. Um, so if you do have an ORCID account, is everyone familiar with ORCID? I'm getting nods. Okay, cool. Um, so you can actually sync your ORCID account with your Figshare account so that anything that you publish on the platform is uh, synced to your ORCID, um, so you can get credit there. Uh, you also will note that there's a little blue box in the top right corner. Um, so this is a public profile of a faculty member from Imperial College London who I like to use in my examples um, because he has created a tool that pulls content directly from his local machine once he's running experiments in his X-ray crystallography machines as a chemist and it gets pushed uh, directly to Figshare, auto-populates the metadata fields, and he can just click publish. So he has over 2,500 uploads, and you can kind of see that reflected in the views, downloads, and even citations of uh, the content that he's made public on the platform. Um, so just a, a good example, I might circle back to him in a bit. Um, another way that we track retention is uh, through altmetric.com. 
And so they're a company that takes a look at engagement with your content once you've made it publicly available. So it'll look at tweets, if your content has been picked up by a news outlet, by a blog, um, and that'll be reflected on the actual item page. And so this example um, is Excellence Are Us. It's a preprint, uh, university research and the fetishization of excellence. Um, oddly has really excellent uh, alt metrics around it. Um, so it was picked up by a bunch of news outlets and blogs, blogged 11 times, three Facebook pages. So in lieu of a citation, you can see the immediate attention that your research is getting once it is uh, published to the world. Um, I also mentioned the citations. This is a new development. Um, you can ignore this fantastic title, uh, Supplemental Materials to Submitted Paper. Um, you can see maybe that's why it doesn't have a very high altmetric score, but it has been cited seven times. Um, so there is some value in this. Uh, and so we are trying to show that as a way to in engage with researchers and, and, and try and get them, you know, give them some incentives to make their research publicly available. Uh, and this came up last night, I wanted to talk about this. Um, our API is fully open and documented. Um, you can find it at docs.fakeshare.com. Um, you can actually do more programmatically through the API than you can for the actual Figshare GUI. And so in uh, the spirit of open science and just open data in general, we want to make that as openly possible, uh, uh, open as we possibly can. And as such, we adhere to the Open API initiative Everything is documented on Swagger. It'll look super familiar to you. Um, and it also works really well with the community. So I mentioned um, we have a push and pull from GitHub where you can sync your GitHub account. If you uh, program in R um, and you use RStudio, you can publish directly to Figshare or pull content from Figshare um, using RStudio. We work with the Open Science Framework. There's a whole bunch of things. We're actually going to set up a marketplace um, where you can actually look at uh, tools that people have built on, on the API, which is really and so this is my last slide. Um, we have, th this is actually an article on, on Figshare, how to make your research open access. And so uh, just to sum it up, it is a platform that allows you to publish um, your content in any format. Um, and we try to make it as discoverable as possible so you can get uh, the attention and credit that you deserve for your research. So this is where you can find me, or you can tweet us directly at Figshare. And thanks so much. Thanks, Dan. Um, I also want to mention that if anyone here is interested in putting content on Figshare, Kilt Hope are actually having a session tomorrow, 12 to noon, to help people get started with that. Um, any questions for Dan? I like those. <laughs> So no, thank you for a very complete presentation. One of the things I've seen with, with infrastructure like Figshare is um, they tend to kind of be around for a few years and then they're sort of not around, right? You think about things like code.google.com, research data, so even SourceForge or something like that. So I wanted to ask you about the sustainability model. So how do you, are you, are you doing subscriptions from universities or how do you, how are, how are you sort of making sure that you're gonna be here in five years, 10 years? Yeah, so. Um, who pays the bills? <laughs> uh, so I mentioned the Carnegie email. No. Um, we, we do, <laughs> when, when I had the slide before about all the different communities that we serve, I can actually do that. Yeah, yeah so um, we want to keep the tool free for end users. That's the Mark, uh, our founder, Mark Hamill, that's his, that's his mission, and it is his belief that this should be available as a resource globally. Um, what we started doing when we were first approached by publishers and then shortly thereafter by institutions is we wanted to extend that infrastructure as an enterprise solution. So we do um, sell services to foundations and governments, to academic publishers, to institutions as a way to uh, keep the company moving forward. And so we are a commercial institute organization, um, but free components. So can, you, can you also, just a follow-up question. Yeah. Um, so does that, um, it, the, so that you're self-supporting through the efforts that you're describing there, yes. and so then what is the relationship with the Major Springer family? Right, okay. <laughs> so, um, Figshare is part of the digital science portfolio, and, and um, we receive funding from digital science, and digital science itself was born out of, I believe, biomedical biology, one, one of the head editors at Nature. Um, when the merger happened, they kept digital science kind of separate from Springer Nature, um, just because we were our own entity, but we still have that dotted line to one of the parent companies of Nature. 
Um, Figshare is unique in that, and I'm allowed to say this because I actually saw the papers, um, we still have autonomy because uh, digital science itself does not have a majority stake. So we are still allowed to do things like leave Figshare.com open to the public. Um, and we get to make a lot of the decisions around business models and, and, and why we do what we do. Um, there, of course, is support in the form of from digital science, um, and has kind of helped us start up um, as a small company. But yeah. did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like we'll see on Twitter that exact example. Somebody will tweet out like preprint on archive, uh, code on GitHub, you know, figures with specific licenses on Figshare. Um, and in that case, they just wanted to retain licenses for some of the supplementary content that they've included uh, alongside their preprint. Um, it could just be you've actually published all of your work and at the end of uh, the grant, you have all of this maybe potentially negative results that you wanted to make openly available. It, it's really up to the to the researcher. So we don't we don't say you have to do it this way, um, but we do have uh, uh, mechanisms in place to kind of control that. So we like to say Figshare is as open as possible, as closed as necessary. Um, so you can publish confidential files where you upload the file itself, um, so it's kind of backed up on, on the infrastructure, but only the metadata is available. Or you can release files under an embargo. Or um, you can link to files that exist elsewhere but still need a DOI. So it's trying to meet researchers where they're at um, and wherever, I guess, they're comfortable releasing that content. How do you normalize the data, right? So if individual researchers submit the data, how can you make sure that somebody that searches the results of one of those researchers will get the other one because he did something similar? I'm sorry, I didn't. All right, let, let, let me try. So let's assume for a moment that you have two researchers that are doing brain research, and one of them submits the results with one, uh, term that he's using for his cells that he's using, and the other researcher is using some different term for the same cells. Is there any way to normalize this on your end? Yeah, so th this is a question we get asked a lot, and it involves uh, curation, actually, mm -hmm. um, trying to tweak the content as it comes in. On Figshare.com, um, we just do a light touch review to make sure that the content that's being uploaded is uh, of an academic nature. Um, with our enterprise tool, we actually do have curation modules where um, subject specialists can look at that content prior to publication. So once you click publish, it goes into this curation queue, and you can have subject experts at your university uh, weigh in and help uh, provide best practices around metadata assignment um, and, and try and aid in that normalization. Um, we aren't as restrictive on the end user platform just because of the volume of content that comes in but we are taking a closer look at actually curating content and adding um, tiers of, you know, what was, what was my fun example here? Uh, supplemental materials to submitted paper. Like, maybe that is not as complete as, as it could be, so that would be a tier two. Whereas if something would be of uh, actual academic publication quality, that would be a tier three, and it could be indexed um, at a different level.
Okay, our last speaker for this panel is Victoria Stodden. She is Associate Professor of Statistics at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. so far. Um, slight correction, I'm in the School of Information Sciences, but I do have a courtesy appointment in the Department of Statistics at, um, at Illinois. Uh, so I updated the title of this session to insert the word code in there and include this in the discussion along with data. And I think they're quite separate objects, uh, so data and code get considered separately, but they're inextricably linked, right? You're never accessing data without code, and typically when you have code, you are um, using it to access some kind of data, and not necessarily, but typically. So I sort of changed that, and then I put computational in there for reasons I'm going to explain in just one moment. So just before I get started, I also put my slides on my website, so if I go too quickly or you want to explore a link or whatnot, they're there, and you can grab them if you have a device and go at your own speed. I'm gonna move pretty quickly because I have 10 to 12 minutes and a number of things I wanna say. Okay, so. Uh, let me just move really quickly and just go right to notions of reproducibility. Pardon? What? You take 15 minutes. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> well, in that case. <laughs> um, okay, so let me, I'll go a little slower. So I wanted to think about how do we think about notions of reproducibility and what does it mean? Actually, already through the talks that we've seen this morning, uh, people have different lenses on the word or what it means for their research. So I wanted to try and pull that apart a little bit because it, I think it makes a difference in how we um, operationalize that in our work as researchers, uh, institutionally and in infrastructure. So I'm gonna take some time to do that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about tools, cyber infrastructure, some of these um, emerging efforts that are coming out, including things I've been working on and uh, some of the ideas behind some of this, and then touch on artifact availability um, if I can by the end. All right, so we use this word reproducibility um, all the time, which I think is great. It's really important as uh, part of our discourse. How it relates to computational and data-enabled research I think has certain nuances around it, and I've often seen the word reproducibility used in conversations and people mean totally different things. So I have found it um, helpful to pull out three different ways of thinking about reproducibility. You may or may not agree, you might have others or whatnot, but this is something I found useful and it also I think maps to larger national conversations that are going on around reproducibility across different communities that are actually talking about different things as well. So the first one is empirical reproducibility. So empirical reproducibility in my mind is our traditional idea of reproducing a physical experiment. So if you think about before we had computational affordances, augmenting and leveraging our research, uh, we would have done something like recording a lab notebook steps that we did and the expectation would be that another group would be able to get to the same results. So this is how we've done science for hundreds of years. Right? So that's what I mean by empirical reproducibility. This is talked about a lot today in part of the reproducibility debate and I think it has its own set of remedies to it. Um, another form of reproducibility is statistical reproducibility. We heard Rebecca this morning talking about her history as a statistician and how this maps to reproducibility issues, which indeed it does. They're separate from the empirical reproducibility issues, so statistical reproducibility would be things like, do you expect your inferences from the data to, be, to also appear in another sample? for example. So how much do you expect your work to generalize across different samples? Ideally, all the time, right? And so if it's not, and the statistics are breaking, like for example, the discussion around p-hacking and so on, um, then that to me falls in the bucket of statistical reproducibility. The last one that I pull out, which has been um, the discussion in this se session primarily, is computational reproducibility as sort of a separate animal around reproducibility. So here I'm thinking about how do we make those computational steps that have allowed us to make those inferences from the data, the scientific inferences and claims, how do we make them transparent so that they can be inspected verified, reused, and so on. Right now, as we all know, when we publish works that are computationally enabled, which is just about everything we publish, most of the time the computational aspects are buried, 
opaque, inaccessible. They're, it's very difficult to describe them in words even in the text, and words are just not that useful if you want to see how things are actually implemented on a machine anyway. So we've got a lot of work to do in computational reproducibility, and that's where I tend to focus my research. Okay. So here's um, a frame that I take out of computational reproducibility, and one of the ways I like to think about its importance relative to how we have done science for hundreds of years. <coughs> and if you think about what we're doing um, in terms of the scientific method, we have, uh, we sort of typically think of it as two branches, right? The first branch around uh, deduction, so we have mathematics, formal logic, and sort of deductive reasoning to allow us to develop new logic. This fails at some point, right? If we want to understand where we should be planting our crops on the floodplains of the Nile, deductive logic can only get us so far. So we have the um, second branch, empirical or inductive branch, where we do statistical analysis of controlled experiments. Now there's an enormous amount of talk for the last 10 years plus around how computation and data have enabled third and second branches of the scientific method. So I put a question mark here, branch three, four at the bottom, and my argument is, do we really have these branches of the scientific method the same way we do for this first and second branch if we're not enabling transparency, verifiability, and reproducibility with these branches the same way that are embedded in the first two? So why do we even have a scientific method? It's because by definition for research, we don't know the right answer. And every step we take to try to learn more about our world is fraught with error. Every single step, it, it, we could be off track at any point, right? We don't know by definition because we don't know the right answer. And we are fallible as researchers, who knows, right? So this is one of the reasons science is open and, and the methods are open to scrutiny to try and ensure that we're rooting error out of the research and discovery process all the way through as much as we can. So this is something that's incorporated into the first and second branches. You don't go to, say, a mathematical journal and say, I have a new theorem, it's awesome, uh, but there's no proof, I just want you to believe me. Right. They, they would say, no, we're not going to publish this without the proof. I want to know why you think that's true. Why do, you, wh why do you think that doesn't have errors in it? And we'll expose it to the community. Similarly with the empirical branch. There's a long-standing um, entire way that you conduct and disseminate the research. There's a machinery of hypothesis testing that are used with appropriate statistical methods. And then there's a very structured way that that's communicated in the methods section in the paper. Similarly, if you try to submit a paper and you leave your method section blank, you know it will be immediately rejected. There's like no question, right? So here's the, the challenge I think that is before us on the computational reproducibility side is right now it's a potential third, fourth branch of the scientific method until we develop comparable standards to what is already adhering to the first and second branches. So I don't mean to criticize the computational branches and the ambition. We've been thinking about this for maybe 20 years, right? The other branches have had a couple of hundred years to come up with their standards. But in computational research, what's our analogy for the proof? What allows people to really check and make sure that this is something that they understand how the results were derived, they are able to buy in that this is very likely correct as the author is asserting and understand and support the claim. Okay, so there's a quote that I'll just read quickly about this and I want you to note that it's from sentiment that was published and expressed in 1992 even though the, um, the quote is from 1998. <laughs> the idea is um, it talks about what it means to do computationally enabled research. So basically pretty much all the research we publish today. And it says that if you want to think about what reproducibility means in that context, here's the idea. It's that an article about computational science, so any computationally enabled research, in, an, in a scientific publication is not the scholarship itself, it's advertising of the scholarship. So here, what we, well, the way I like to think about it is if you sort of have all your work as this kind of big 
iceberg, right? You know that the tip is what's showing in the scholarly record. And all of that work is a lot of the computational work that happens. And this is, this is a lot of real scholarship that's going on that is never exposed the typical way that we publish today. So then the quote goes on, the actual scholarship is the complete set of instructions and data that generated the figures, the tables, the findings and results in the paper. So that's something that we can start to consider as part of a natural publication and part of the scholarly record. Okay, I have just a little note here because I often get a question about reproducing these computational steps and essentially the question goes something like this, like, who cares? If you can reproduce it, you're not actually advancing science. I'm much more interested if someone re-implements the entire experiment, say, for example, rewrite software and comes to similar or the same results. And I, you know, I completely agree. However, you will only come to similar results. You won't get to, say, whatever decimal point, the same results as another experiment. So I would argue you still need this level of computational transparency to understand why those results are different. Are they, is this within some noise threshold on just you know, variability in the data? Or is this something where there's really a meaningful difference in the implementation that we want to reconcile? So I think we are moving towards this world of radical transparency in the service of science. Okay, a couple things just to really mention quickly. So this article came out at the end of um, 2016 in Science. And what we did in this article is we put together seven recommendations that are at the community level for taking steps towards realizing this. I guess I shouldn't really call it future of radical transparency, but future of scientific transparency. And one of the things we wanted to do here, the same as I did in the title, was bring the discussion around code, workflows, and um, instructions around the data to the same level of the discussion as data. We hear a lot about open data now, which is great. I don't want that to just sit in isolation. That's part of a larger context around research, around reproducibility, around the software and the environments that, in which the data are embedded. So I'll go through these very fast. So the first recommendation, share your stuff. <laughs> Get the data, software workflows, details about the environment out there in trusted open repositories. The second one, link to the stuff in your paper. So share it and set up um, persistent links that the repositories we've seen in the other talks can help establish. Put them in your paper before you publish the paper so that people aren't kind of Googling around on your name and paper title and hoping to find some library you've put somewhere, hopefully not on your webpage, hopefully in a repository. But get those links actually embedded in there. And cite yourself. So if you use code and data that you have shared as one of the artifacts that supports your claims, maybe you have a link in your publication the way I just mentioned, but give the citation too. So we don't have established citation standards for these artifacts and whatever you think you need to be sharing for computational transparency, <coughs> but just do your best. We'll keep iterating on it. And of course, cite anybody else's work that you've leaned on that's beyond ideas <coughs> around the artifacts. If someone uses your data, or they extend your software, then there's a ready-made citation they can just copy out of your paper and use, right? And help cite you and get this, this problem solved around citation. Um, documentation, journals can check all this stuff at the point of publication, and then use open licensing, which is uh, an area I've done a lot of research in to enable reuse. I probably won't have time to go into it, but make sure all of your stuff is licensed appropriately. So is that two minutes to 15? Okay. <coughs> And the, the last one, the last recommendation is support research in this area. It's not obvious how to do all of this stuff in research contexts. So considering this as a, as a research area that we can start to understand what reproducibility means in computational settings where there may be a, you know, privacy implications with the data and other aspects, let's do research on what that actually means. Okay, lots of infrastructure solutions are popping up there. These are all hot linked and they're all very cool. I don't have time to talk to them. Um, two things I'm just gonna mention in my last 90 seconds. So I've been working on a collaborative project that we call the Whole Tail Project where we are trying to create environments that support the entire discovery pipeline for a researcher. And the idea is when they go through their research, so this is enabled with tools that meet researchers where they are, like our studio, Jupyter Notebooks, and so on. The idea is when they get to the end of their research pipeline, they can publish what's called a tail, meaning story and also long tail of research. They can publish this as a bundle that then allows people to discover code and data linked in strategically with the actual results itself. 
Okay, so I'm going to leave you to explore this. This is basically just what I said, details about the tales too. It's actually open now. We released our first public version in July, so please use it. We have, um, or test it out and tell us what's wrong. We have ways to capture feedback and bug reports and you can tell us issues and anything you run into on Wholetail, and it's just at wholetail.org. You can get in with your institutional ID, so CMU, PIT, and so on IDs will work. Um, my, the final thing I'm gonna say is another project that I've been working on here, my totally different collaborators on this project. This is called Easy Data Management Plan. So we're trying to operationalize how data management plans are constructed so that they bring attention to more artifacts than just data, like for example, software workflows and so on. And, um, and then we're also trying to make them understandable by machines instead of just free text. So they can understand what's, like, like a funding agency can understand what's going on in the community, what resources are they using, you know, are there repositories that are missing or people gravitating towards certain, you know, infrastructure that needs more support and so on. Right now that's basically impossible with the current data management plans. So it's also released if you're interested and uh, that's, uh, the URL is here, dev.ezdmp.org, and we have a form here to uh, ask if you wanted to give us feedback on that one too, because that's also new, newly released this summer. And, uh, and we would love for you people to play around with these tools and give us feedback. And these are just little sort of ways that we can chip away at what it means to be computationally transparent in the research that we're, that we're doing. Okay, that is, it, <laughs> my conclusion is that we will become far more deeply and massively computational in our research. This means we have to be more transparent in terms of being able to manage the size of these jobs and the scale of the research. In turn, this transparency will allow us to become more effective and more ambitious in terms of the computational um, projects that we actually attempt as scientists. So thank you. very much for that interesting talk. So the question is about actually when you in your distinguish when you distinguish between replication and reproducibility, yeah. you use the phrase noise threshold to describe like one thing we might wish to compare them. And that, yeah. I think so. Could, yes. Okay. Um, and one thing about this is that it implies that computational reproducibility is a property of the results of a paper. You describe like the, this figure is reproducible. But an earlier definition you use, and the one I use, is the code is computationally reproducible. So when we describe something as computationally reproducible, what is that a property of? It's a, it's, it's a great question, and we can even extend exactly what you're saying, not just what it's a property of, but what does it even mean in terms of um, if I can't say I do have your code, and I am, like, say we ascribe it to the code, and I am able to run things and get some output, how do I even understand whether this is evidence supporting, like it's close enough to your results that it's supporting your results, or this is counter evidence, it's far enough away. So we want to be able to do that diff on the processes, right? So I would, I always talk about reproducibility in the terms of the results. So I don't talk about data reproducibility, code reproducibility, and so on. I think those are sort of second order considerations. What I care about is the claims. So when, when I want to reproduce those claims, I do want that code that you ran to do it when they're published in the scholarly record, bugs and all. I, I want that exact data snapshot, the exact version that you used as an input, mistakes and all. There may be different versions that update this and improve it, but if it's in the scholarly record, that's the pipeline that I want snapshotted. So that's the way that I think about it. Does that answer the question? Okay. Instead of like really being how did you get there and kind of somebody reproduce it. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, this is a very good question. And, and reproducibility is not equally easy for all groups, right, or all types of research. Some have easier time than others. And one of the places you start running into barriers are very large data sets. So CERN, for example, for more than a decade has been espousing openness. They want to make their data open and so Just they have sheer size constraints. And so they're making decisions about what level, you know, what point in the filtering and the sort of reduction of the data can we actually make things open. So that's great and admirable, right? But, but so this was really more a talk about what goals should we be going for. And things like how, you know, how long does the code need to run? Right? And so no one expects this to run indefinitely. I, I think that's unreasonable. But then people start saying, okay, so we can actually sort of set up different types of containerization and so on to keep things running. Well, how does that run on a HPC context and so on? And so I think that's was sort of my recommendation seven, that there are super interesting research questions here. We don't, it's not obvious that we have all the answers and it's not a question of flipping a switch in a research pipeline, just making it open, right? There are cultural changes as well, incentive problems that we address in some of those recommendations and challenging infrastructural problems. Um, having said that, one of the things that I've noticed is um, what I would have thought were easier um, uh, problems to solve in terms of computational transparency, where there are shorter scripts or smaller data sets and so on, like where I come from in statistics, um, I haven't always seen the same uptake compared to communities where I would have thought things were really hard. Like for example, in HPC community, there are many advances going on around reproducibility even now. Um, requirements on computational transparency for accepted papers in supercomputing, for example. So this has been a few years in the works, and this is something where more than half the papers that are accepted now have their artifacts available. And if you want to choose a community that has a real challenge, they often have unique hardware they're working on, bespoke software that goes with that hardware. Um, standard tools are often implement, difficult to implement in that environment, like Docker, for example. And yet, somehow, this community is really running with this as a really important part of their research. So it, a lot of it, it comes down to culture. And it's not something where I think the standards are that there's a, it, you're not necessarily a bad researcher for not being transparent, but it's about taking steps and doing what's possible and what you can within the constraints of your own sort of research environment. And you know, as the HPC community is telling us, there's, there's really amazing things that can happen even in very challenging communities and challenging research problems. So sort of piggybacking a little bit off the last question, yeah. but how do you feel about the relationship between reproducibility and openness? So, for example, if you need to have a supercomputer to reproduce yeah. the, the experiment, or if you need uh, proprietary software, yes. something like that, what are your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. So the, the first thing is, I think there's value to actually being able to inspect code. Now, I know, even if you don't intend on running it, it may be for a supercomputer where nobody wants to actually put the allocation time into rewriting experiments, for example, but inspecting even key parts of code can be really useful to understand implementation. So I think there is an argument there. Um, again, that's hard, too, because many of these code bases have been um, uh, developed not in an open source way for decades, right? And so again, you can't flip the switch, but maybe it's an opportunity to refactor and look at codes and so on. It's made, maybe it's a new way of doing research. So that leads to your first question about the relationship between openness and reproducibility. I see reproducibility as a small subset of openness. And my personal opinion is openness is too big a concept and too ill-defined to be useful for a scientist to understand how to actually tomorrow make a difference and do a better job releasing their work. Reproducibility, especially on the computational side, my, my experience is scientists get this, right? Okay, so I think if I make this, I use this code, this needs to go open, here's the data that I use. That's a much smaller problem, right, than openness. So do I make all my data available? Do I put like every version of every software? Like what does openness mean? And I think it can be intimidating. So I've said, so one of the things I've said in the past is the notion of reproducibility can scope openness in a way that can be actionable by scientists and institutions because I think it's a little more clear exactly what you would do. It's not clear and solved, but it might be a little more clear than the concept of openness. So that seems to me lower hanging fruit is the way that I thought about it. And I like the way that it knits the pieces together. Like it knits the code and the data and the claims together versus a data set hanging out there. I just don't think it's that. Or a piece of code just sort of hanging there. It's not, that, 
that doesn't go to our vision of what it's for, right? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so now I'm gonna invite our speakers to come back up here for the panel. I'll start off our questions. Um, a lot of people here have talked about data sets that involve human subject or patient data, and Victoria touched upon the privacy point, and so I just wanted to ask if any of you could comment on the potential barriers that is creating for sharing data, and how do we fit those ethics into open science? consenting up front that lets people do whatever they want in the research front with this data. Now granted, this is normal. This is easier because this is for quote, normal patients. But that's still not to say that we won't find things in their single cell genomics that would be not, we, they think they're normal, they may not be. But so I think that's one thing too is we move forward looking toward better consenting to make this, to really uh, avoid some of the legal challenges. I just have a, a comment. It's, it's not really a question per se, but I've been encountering this issue a lot. I do a lot of applied health research in prospective longitudinal studies. And one of the study I work with has followed 1,500 kids from the 1920s through their death. So some have been publicly identified, most have not, and we have death certificates and cause of death collected. And just a couple of wrinkles with this. So for example, we often, um, and of course I'm very interested in sharing data, but to share my data, people would get date of birth and date of death information as well as sensitive psychological information, for example. I'll just highlight one participant in my study is a person who founded the Manhattan Project. So very public people where it would be consequential if that information got out. So I feel um, ethically I couldn't share the health information at the same time as any kind of psychological information because that could lead to I, not, clear not only clear identification of people but also clear identification of sensitive issues uh, information. And some wrinkles to this are the um, 
feedback I usually get in psychology journals is that if I require people to go through my IRB, then it's not truly open access. And I'm like, well, but I also can't just give people open access to personal information like that. And on the flip side, the director of NIH has told me that he believes that the right to privacy ends at death. So because all of my participants are dead, they no longer have a right to privacy of that kind of information. So like, I'm sort of, you know, on the very, um, I would say, cautious end of this, and, and respectfully because these people were living information in the 50s and 60s, and they couldn't have imagined computers where this stuff would have been online. But certainly, I get a lot of different perspectives from other scientists, and it's kind of a hard, hard line to walk. And so, anyway, just some food for thought about um, the different kinds of data from, like, you know, cell lines or computer modeling or things like that. Um, these wrinkles become really complicated. Hi. Um, awesome talks. I was trying to think of sort of a question that might kind of bind a lot of this together. Maybe it's a really stupid question, I'm not sure. Um, so is, is anyone thinking about sort of like we like statistically you know multiple comparisons are a thing? Uh, do open data sets expire, or are there ways of keeping track of usage that would sort of you know make sense of this? There are a lot of repositories, there are a lot of places where this data is going. Uh, is there any sense of implementing something like this going going forward? <laughs> It's a really good idea, not that I've ever seen or heard of in the repository community. I have heard in stats community, people who do research on this, wondering about, basically they didn't use the word expiration, but I like that categorization of data. Um, but so suppose you run a test on say, some NOAA data or something like that, and you happen to have been the millionth test to run it, but you just don't know, it's the first test you ran. So what do you do in this situation? And so that, that's something where these, the, I think these points that are being surfaced in these comments here show a very rich area for research. <laughs> but I, have, I haven't seen that this come up in, in the repository in a structured way. I mean, this is still an area where, you know, statisticians are even doing research just to understand how to resolve multiple comparisons with many tests alone, let alone, you know, apply it to a data set in the repository as an institutionalized structure. I will say that sponsors are thinking about that. I mean, there's a discussion in Washington where they're saying you, we can't keep all scientific data, it's just too much. And so how, how we threshold that, where do we, where do we draw the line of raw data and just keep, let's say, curated or pre-processed data and ditch the raw? And when do we decide that a community data set is expired or obsolete? Um, so those are very much of interest to us too because we look at community data sets on our resources Everything is fine, so at what point, at what point do you say you can't do that anymore? We had that same discussion for the Hive last week. We would very much like to get all raw data from sequencing centers and tissue mapping centers and so on. Um, not clear they'll be giving us all of that, but we'd like to have the raw data because we know everyone will want to reprocess it in different ways as algorithms move forward. And then the question is how long do we keep it? So that's what we will be wrestling with. Um, prior to joining CMU, I was working at Terminal where they do high energy physics. Um, the answer to this question is they just keep all the data. They need to keep all the raw data. There is a pipeline that generates a lot of data in the process. Uh, that one, they let spark after a certain number of years, but then experiments that happen in the 70s, 80s, that's data that has to be installed uh, because of reproducibility uh, concerns. So I just wanted to add that data from there. So the answer, I would say, is different for different use cases. Uh, in particular, for the community data sets initiative that we have, the criteria is, is it being used by the community, right? And what are the constraints we have? So we do have a certain limit to how many uh, or how big are the data sets that we host at the center. Pretty much everything I was going to say was slowly answered. <laughs> 
But uh, I, I will build on that last point about uh, date from last use. Um, that's one that we see a lot, um, especially in the UK. There's m many policies for, with the institutions that we work with saying that um, they are willing to delete data um, after 10 years of la from last use. So those are the kinds of things that we're being asked to actually measure for them. Um, and, but of course, that policy varies between institutions, countries, disciplines. So um, I think uh, with our own uh, restrictions, it's, it is based on storage. And so we're thinking about that, but at the same time, cloud storage is becoming cheaper, especially the one that you purchase. So um, yeah. Um, I just wanted to draw, I think, a subtle distinction about what you were saying and the conversation we've been having here which is, I, my, my impression from what you were saying is you were interested in sort of um, the power of statistical inputs, right, on a paper. Yeah. And that, uh, on, a, on a data set, and that's a subset, right, of sort of generalized how much should we keep or not keep it, and which you can discuss with Cope as well, right? And so, uh, so I think something like what you're suggesting could inform, you know, these types of discussions, and I don't think it does at this point, but I think, I think it could. Um, one thing that I also wanted to mention is that these ideas too, so these, these ideas you were talking about, about how long do you sort of preserve artifacts, you could ask the same question, so when is when is it worth reproducing a result, right? So, so some results you, the community's very interested in and they really want to have a lot of understanding and certainty around them. Other results just probably aren't worth the effort to actually go and do the full reproduction of the, of the result. So there's, so, so these aren't clear answers, right? At this point, for some of these sort of cutting edge <laughs> questions like yours, we're pushing the envelope and we're sort of learning the landscape of issues and uh, so we don't have, have answers there. But I think the trajectory is really clear about the sort of direction we're going. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, I wouldn't ask about something else, but I do want to say please keep the raw data. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and cloud-based as well. And I think it is kind of a, who's going to make the judgment of what is good and bad and how do we know what we're going but you're right, the issues are coming out as they come. Um, I just wanted to say that you should also think is, um, when is de-identified data sufficient? I really love the idea, let's be proactive and have it in the consent level. That's absolutely great. And But you know, looking back, um, just not providing the subject's name, is that sufficiently de-identified? I know that there are a lot of example, with brain imaging, you can sometimes have enough data to reconstruct part of that, or the face and so forth. So, so that's another issue that perhaps needs to be looked at and prioritized, because we want to be able to share the data, and we want to protect human subjects. So I think those two are very important elements, the consenting part and how to de-identify the data. <laughs> so uh, I was part of a, um, four authors who got together to do a co-edited book, um, uh, 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 Big Data and the Public Good. And one of the things we did with chat, we sort of solicited these chapters, and Helen Nissenbaum and Solon Barakas, they, they submitted a chapter, this was 2014, and essentially their, their chapter said, we don't have informed consent anymore. And the reason we don't have it is because we don't know how these data are gonna be linked to other data in the future, so we really can't tell people what they're, like in, in any kind of reasonable way what the risks are or aren't because we don't know. And so their argument was we're, we're sort of we're doing this end run around informed consent and we're better to kind of be honest with people that it, this could be discoverable in ways that we don't understand yet. And so something like, I would argue, removing the name almost surely will be able to, I mean if there's any complexity in the data, almost surely we'll be able to kind of back off what's going on in there. So that's paired against this landscape of changing norms as well around patients and subjects sense of what's appropriate with their data. But the idea, of, but I think we're, we're, we're sort of, the, the idea of informed consent is it's traditionally understood as coming under a lot of challenge because of future data linking. I know you want to talk about that. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 I, th I think the challenge here is that as data sets get linked, they can really be used in ways that no one perceives. Yeah, that's right. And that's, that's the real thing. You know, we've been, I mentioned the hive data, that's just looking at biomolecular atlas. But when you start looking at other data sets, and in our view, or my view, they 
a real value of community data is when you start pulling together disparate data sets to be able to bring together interdisciplinary research and ask new questions. That's very really good, but it also exposes a lot more of these weaknesses in privacy. Over here. Um, thank you so much for your talks. I love this idea of open data and open sharing, and I guess I have a practical question of how do we speak the same language? So the way I index my data is going to be different than the way Josh indexes data and when we send data to which we haven't. But if we were to in this imaginary open sharing world, um, we would have to then learn each other's languages and, our, and it, it makes it very challenging, especially with these huge data sets and just as a practical limitation um, in reviewing all these papers and the expectations for each paper is so humongous. And these, you know, and it's so much data collected. I don't even know how to evaluate data when given the raw data and the source code. And so, how do we practically go about this problem? Let me put a plug. In. So, I, I think that's a great. It, it, it comes down to ontologies and metadata, right? You know, what words do we use interchangeably for each other's data? What can be mapped and what can't? So, if one set of, if one paper refers to age in bins of zero to 30, 30 to 60, and above. Others give numbers, and how do you put all those on the same footing? Um, we got NSF funding to host a conference here at CMU in May. This is myself, Paula, Keith, and Melanie. We're all here in the room, it's amazing. Um, <laughs> but this will be May on applying machine learning techniques to scientific data discovery and reuse. And there's a lot that can happen there. The Google data set search is one example. It's in the fields, it can only do so many things now. We certainly expect to have Google there. But really looking at the techniques that can help us with that discoverability, with doing the automatic discovery of the ontologies, to help us understand how to put the data sets on the same footing so we can work with them together. And I think that's where we really need help because we've been developing community-centric data sets around different domains, different countries have done data collections. And now we just have hundreds of different styles, and they're still not talking. I want you to comment on this, because I think if I heard you correctly, you said 1,200 formats were supported in pictures? Yeah. OK, we're why do we have 1,200? There are 6,600 different file types. Well, worse, right? So we don't, we don't need that. And that's like not even getting to your question about reconciling variables and so on, but just even getting the formats to talk. And so that's something where, as a community, we don't, we shouldn't tolerate yet another, you know, format. We need things in sort of open, machine readable, to as low level as we can possibly get. And that's something where, um, you know, we have work to do as we interact with, um, you know, equipment and so on that produces proprietary formats. And what do we tolerate? And what where are our standards in terms of openness too? But that, that I, yeah, I thought you might have something to say about that because that just seems unreal. Yeah. Are a lot of your formats for instruments? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's. So proprietary formats, it's a thing that happens, especially in scientific research, people are creating their own file formats, which is really fun. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think it kind of goes to this whole idea of the research object. There are two things that um, I usually try and speak to um, when, it, when it comes to trying to understand other people's data. Um, so the idea of a research object, which is some of the best metadata that you can have is in the form of a publication, and I'm not trying to put the article on the pedestal know its limitations, but um, it does explain the methodology. And if you have the raw data outputs, the clean data, the actual protocols <coughs> that led to that point that you were trying to claim in your article, that can kind of shed a little bit more light as opposed to just sharing uh, data randomly. And so we've been thinking really, really hard about uh, ways to kind of link all of that information together and put it, uh, present it in a way where it is kind of uh, under as understandable as it could be. Um, there are also larger community initiatives um, that have, the one that uh, I always hear but hasn't been mentioned yet today is FAIR. Um, and it's thinking about uh, data and making it findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable both for humans and machines. And I think that kind of circles back around to this whole idea of using uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, to understand that, that data that you're being presented with. So, Thinking about it high level, it's it's starting to get there, but um, I, I, I think we're putting whatever it's the metaphor I'm wearing, cart before the horse. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you to our panelists.
Um, we have lunch out in the lobby. Um, sorry, round of applause. <laughs> Um, lunch is on the lobby, but you're welcome to bring your food back in here if you need more space for eating and conversation. Um, we will reconvene for our third panel, um, which is about open tools, um, at 1.30. Thank you.